Hello everybody, welcome back to Alan Wall's Photography. This is Alan, Circle of Confusion. Number two, thickening your drops, local adjustments pre-stack, and being objective. Just in case you haven't already done so, I put another link in the show notes for this video so that you can go over to Discord and join our lively group where you can ask questions, share photos, critique others, be critiqued, you name it, we do it all over there. The first uh, question is not really a question. It uh, comes from a conversation that I've been having with Scott Murphy. He has been setting up his first uh, water drop uh, station uh, using the same splash art equipment that I use. And the subject of thickening the water came up. Came up because I brought it up. <laughs> I think it's one of the best ways to really uh, make the photographs jump out of the page. So there are several ways that you can make your water drop photographs better. We've talked about a lot of them, adding some color using different lighting techniques. But one of the ways we haven't talked a lot about is changing the liquid that you use. Now, a lot of people like to uh, use milk or cream or a mixture of the two with some food coloring, which do make for, for some really lovely photographs. But less commonly, uh, but well worth trying uh, is changing the consistency of your regular tap water. You can do this by adding various things to the water. Uh, a lot of people will put sugar or clear syrup. In America, it's called caro syrup, I think. I think that's what it's called. In England, it's called... Um, they don't have it in England. <laughs> I come to think of I don't think I've ever seen it in England. I don't I don't know what they call it. I was thinking I was thinking treacle and golden treacle and that bl hideous black treacle. But I can't think if there was ever a clear one. Don't worry about it. If you add a bunch of sugar or clear syrup to your water, it does thicken it. It also makes everything very sticky, and if you don't clean very carefully, you can end up with a, a stuck valve. So it's not one of my favorite ones to use. Uh, another thing that some people use, I've tried it and I didn't see any difference, was adding a, a rinse, uh, a dishwasher rinsing fluid, a few drops of that. Um, yeah, it didn't work for me at all, but I have read uh, of others who've had good success with it. One thing that's really easy to do that makes a big difference is getting your water as cold as you possibly can. Either stick it in the freezer until it's virtually frozen or uh, put a bunch of ice cubes in your water supply and then use it while it's still very cold. Um, it uh, it, it kind of changes the molecular structure of the water as the temperature gets lower and lower and it's less viscid. It's less runny <laughs> and it can make for some really impressive drops. But my favorite by a mile is xanthan gum. If you take some of that gum, which comes as a crystalline powder, uh, whitish yellow, if you take that stuff and dissolve it in warm water until it's all the way dissolved, and then uh, strain it because it'll form some globby bits here or there. It's a good idea to, I strain it through a, uh, uh, an opened up napkin um, and then put it in a sealed bottle and uh, refrigerate it. That is magic because that really, make, that really makes the water almost stringy. The spikes tend to hold together better. Uh, I love it. Yeah, so xanthan gum, that's xanthan with an X, X-A-N-T-H-A-N, I believe. And I'll put a link in the show notes so that you can see where to, to buy the stuff. But if you haven't tried that, give it a try. Moving on, being objective. This was a question that came up last week. Why can you change the length of extension on a system where you're using an enlarger lens, 
and in doing so, change the magnification. But you can't do that with a microscope objective. It's a good question. An enlarger lens is designed to, to throw a flat representation of the subject onto a flat surface, wherever you put the flat surface. That allows you to change the extension between your sensor and the lens to change the magnification. But if you try to do that with a finite microscope objective, it doesn't work. And why is that? Well, it's in the design of the objective. You'll notice if you try this, if you put a microscope objective on a bellows and then move the bellows forward and backwards, you'll notice that you only actually get a nice, clear, sharp image at the, the tube length of that objective. For most of the finite objectives you're going to encounter, that's going to be 150 or 160 millimeters, depending on the type of microscope it's used on. As you move closer and further away, the image does increase and decrease in magnification, but it also rapidly degrades in quality. And the main reason for that is that all of the corrections that are built into the objective, the corrections for aberrations, like spherical aberrations, as well as color aberrations, chromatic aberrations, are designed to be uh, maximally effective at the end of that tube length, at the end of the optical tube length, where you will either project that image onto a sensor, if you're photographing with it, or you'll project it onto your retina with an eyepiece that will increase the magnification a bit. But all of those corrections happen at that distance. And if you move away from that distance, the loss in quality is so uh, severe that you hardly even notice that your subject is getting bigger and smaller. So that is the, the primary difference. But like I say, there's a whole lot more to it than that. And uh, the case gets even more complicated with uh, an infinity corrected lens. But needless to say, uh, that also does not work the same way as uh, an enlarger lens. Though, by changing to a lower focal length of your relay lens in an infinite system, you can get different uh, magnifications relative to the focal length of the, uh, the uh, relay lens that you're using. For example, with a 10x objective, if you use a 100 millimeter uh, relay lens, tube lens, instead of a 200 millimeter tube lens, you'll get approximately five times magnification. So you can, with an infinity corrected lens, change the distance and get a different uh, uh, magnification, but you also have to change the lens that you're using. So it's not analogous to, to what you would do with the enlarger lens. I hope that's clear. Uh, it's a question a lot of people have, but that's why the objective is not designed uh, to, to be used that way. The last thing I want to touch on today is pre-stack adjustments. But before we do, look what I got at the thrift shop. It was in a little box and it is a real Joby tripod. It's just the smallest one I've ever seen. 99 cents. Brilliant. I don't have anything light enough to put on it. It just collapses, but it's cute to look at. All right. The question I was given was, do you ever uh, use local adjustments to your images before sending them over to Helicon or to Xerine to stack them? And that is a really good question because yes, I do. And I haven't talked about it in a video before you will notice most of the time before I send an image over to, to a Xerine Stacker, depending of course on the photographs, I may uh, drop the, the highlights a little, boost the shadows, whatever it takes to present Xerine with as clear uh, a picture as possible, uh, maybe boost the contrast a little bit. Yes, I will do all of those things. Not always, but usually. Every now and again, 
through bad photographic technique, I find myself with a unique problem. Well, not a unique problem, a very common problem. When I have a stack of photographs, if, if in setting the shot up, I didn't pay close enough attention, and I have some areas that are just too bright, I will on occasion use local adjustments. Now, I very seldom use the gradient adjustment, uh, mainly because it's not specific enough and uh, it tends to cause as many other problems as it fixes. Likewise, I, I don't very often use the elliptical filter. Uh, it has occasionally helped if I have a completely round object, a compound eye, for example, uh, that is overexposed and I want to tone it down but leave everything else about the way it is, then occasionally dropping a, a fairly hard-edged ellipse over the eye using the, the radial filter, then I can apply uh, whatever changes I need just to that eye. On rare occasions, I will use the adjustment brush and in this case, I will sometimes even use it on separate, uh, on separate images in the stack. If I have a very specific problem that only seems to appear in a small cluster of the photographs, I may take the adjustment brush and make some really minor changes to just that selection of the inputs and leave the others alone. Otherwise, I almost always make global changes. So if I have a hundred photographs, I'm going to apply whatever pre-stack uh, sharpening, say, that I do. I'm going to apply that to all of the images equally. But rarely I will use local adjustments, either the radial filter or the adjustment brush to make individual adjustments, even sometimes to individual photographs. So the answer is yes, making local targeted adjustments is a reasonable tactic, but you have to be very mindful of what you're doing. You have to make sure that you're not creating more problems than you're fixing by doing it. And pay attention to the results because that will guide you in the future. This is very much a feel thing. Um, and of course, the argument could be made that you're better off doing whatever adjustments you can do after the fact. Um, I find I get better results if I fix any significant problems before I send the stack over. But to each his own, your mileage may vary. I recommend you give it a try though. It can be a useful tool in the tool chest. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with another circle of confusion before you know it. Other programming coming your way as well. Uh, thank you to my Patreon supporters. I appreciate you very much. And uh, I'll see you guys over on Discord. Don't forget your invitation's waiting. Have a good day. See you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.